Here they come. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are turning on your microphone so that it's easier to have a conversation instead of just using the chat box. I'm probably, it's probably going to be better if I keep mine off. Oh, that's I have fine. a lot of traffic. Um, no, it's out. okay. It's okay. You're free to turn on and off your mics as you please. Um, we do ask that you keep them muted unless you are going to speak. It just makes it a little bit easier for all of us to have a conversation because I know it takes a little bit of time to chat in that box and time will go by faster if we have interaction. So it makes it a little bit more fun. I like it. Thanks for being here. Oh, no problem. The first one was great. I can't wait to see, see where I'm at at the end of it. Awesome. Well, we're going to give everybody just a little bit more time to jump in, and then we will go ahead and get started. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. I hope that last week was uh, in an in interview. Tara, I'll help you in just a second. Um, let me go in. I'm going to, I'm unmuting people's mics so that they're able to uh, communicate back and forth with today's program. And if you would please just keep your microphones muted unless you are going to speak that way background noise doesn't come over. As you know, the session is being recorded and we hope that last week was an adventure and we're glad to see that you returned this week. So with that being said, uh, we're gonna finish up, since we ran over a little bit, we're gonna finish up on what we started last week. And even though um, the schedule says that today we'll be talking about marketing, we really figured that we need to button up the, some of the main parts of the business plan before we get into marketing and we can make this up later. So. Um, Kathy, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and I'm going to turn off my camera, but I'm still here. So feel free. If you don't feel comfortable using your mic, um, you're still welcome to use the chat box as you'd like. Thank you. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I see that some of you have come back for the second of the series and that's great. I'm just kind of curious, did any of you go back and review the recording last week? And again, feel free to unmute and just throw your comments out if you will, please. I did not, Kathy, this is Audra. Um, I did not, but I still, I'm glad it's available because I, I missed that very beginning part and I wanted to go back, so. Okay, good, good. Thank well, I'm just curious and I know that some who had registered and could not join us um, did take advantage of that. So anyway, again, that option is going to be available. And like we did last week, we will send out the link to the recording as well as those handouts. So hopefully you find those of value. And um, I didn't hear from any of you on my email or phone this week about questions. So hopefully that went well with your um, implementation. So I too am going to stop my video so that we can concentrate on the screen and go ahead and move through this. Like Nicole said, we're gonna finish up just a couple of slides that I didn't get to last week. And then we're going to get into um, some really good information today uh, to help you with your, your goals and your mission in your business plan. So, um, if my enter button, there we go. We were talking about who our customers are. And so we need to determine our customer profile. What are some of the things that determine your customer profile? Anybody have a thought? Well, your customer profile is- Kind of, sorry. Go ahead, no, please. I was just gonna say what type of products and services are you offering? Like who does that appeal to? 
Right. So who is your ideal customer? Who do you want to appeal to, right? Who fits into that category? So generally we look at things like, are they a male or female? Are they a professional worker or blue collar? What is their age? What is their income? What kind of neighborhoods do they live in? How do they buy? What is their favorite means? Where do they shop? Are they brick and mortar shoppers? Are they online? Obviously, when we look at their age, we'll find a difference in that as well. So if you've got Gen Xers, it's probably gonna look quite different than if you've got someone who's in their 60s or 70s. When do they shop? Are they early morning shoppers? Are they working from 10 to five? And I think I mentioned this last week. If they're working from 10 to five and we have a brick and mortar store, does it make sense to be open from 10 to five? They don't have that opportunity to shop. Where do they get their information? On social media, the internet? Is it still magazines, newspaper, television, radio? Again, depending on who your um, age is and what their profession is, that's probably gonna make a difference. Where are your customer demographics? Are they going to be within a 30 mile radius? Or are you predominantly doing things online where it could be again, international? And what are the customer psychographics? Psychographics are, are probably something we don't look at quite as often as we should when determining our customer profile. So a demographic are the things we just highlighted. They refer to the selected population characteristic as used in the government, marketing, or opinion research, or the demographic profiles used in such research. That's the hard data. Those things are actual numbers and can be easily obtained. Um, the US Census Bureau obviously does very specific areas in terms of the number of households, how many are living in the household, what is the age, are they one or two income families. Um, generally, we can look at what is the average income, uh, what's, what's the uh, average household value, lots of those kinds of things. And again, the US Census Bureau, if you've not checked them out and are looking for demographic data, is a great place to go, as well as your local chamber of commerce, your economic development departments, and your city governments. All of them have access to that demographic data because they use it on a regular basis. I mentioned the psychographics and, and indicated that something we maybe don't use often enough. It's a little more difficult to do, but it probably even has more bearing than your demographic data does. So the use of demographics to study and measure attitudes, values, lifestyles, and opinions as for marketing purposes. So this is the soft data, the data obtained from such a study. And you're like, wow, what's that mean? Well, in demographics, again, it's the age, gender, location, education level, occupation, income level, marital status, household type. In psychographics, it's the touchy-feely things. It's our psycho part, our mental part. What are our needs? Security, esteem, love, acceptance, understanding, beauty, good health. What are, what are your customers' values? Status, success, greed, simplicity. What are their buying styles? Do they look for price, fads, quality, technology, luxury, convenience? And what about their cultures? Modern, artistic, religious, liberal, conservative, environmental, and particularly their interest. Is it in sports, reading, fitness, cooking, workaholic, gardening? What are those things that will bring your customer to you or better yet, keep them with you? These are a little bit harder to obtain, but once you get your demographics, you start to look at that and you'll see some very common traits Again, oftentimes based on the generations, right? 
So why do we need to know this stuff? Well, it helps us determine who are, is our competition and what is our competition doing? Because remember, we want to be proactive and not reactive. We learned last week, we have to stay ahead of the competition. We've got to be on top of it. So we, by analyzing our competition, we can learn more about what the customer really wants or sometimes what they don't want. What don't they like about your competition? And that can become an opportunity for you, which we'll talk about in a minute. So discover any unserved niche markets. So lots of you may do the same thing. And I'm just going to pick out, um, I'm just gonna pick randomly, uh, let's say it's um, computer services, okay? So there's lots of people that do computer services perhaps, but what is, is not being fulfilled? Where can you find that niche or specialty market that will make you stand out above your competition? It gets ideas for your marketing, merchandising, and your product mix. The product mix is very important. Um, we can't be everything to everyone. So how many items do we need? Let's say we're selling telephone accessories. You know, how many of those um, phone chargers can, can we afford to carry? And there's so many different ones out there. So we have to look at what is the most popular among our demographic. Obtain valuable advice, support, and information, particularly from remote or indirect competition. So those can be a good source for you as well. But you definitely will determine if you have any competitive advantage when you truly analyze your competition. And of course, that's what it's all about. You need to, to do business with me because I do this better than my competition. So in order to take a, a kind of a bird's eye view at this, I suggest that you do a SWOT analysis. SWOT is capital S period, capital W period, capital O period, capital T period. It stands for uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we'll get into that in the next slide as well. But in order to start that, I suggest you do some sort of a little graph like you see here on the screen. List maybe four businesses um, that you're aware of that do the same types of uh, products or services that you do. And then look at their appearance. And again, that can be a brick and mortar store or it could be where people shop, which is what? Perhaps their website, right? Or their social media pages, okay? So we're basing our appearance on that. Doesn't have to be brick and mortar. What about their location? When you Google them, how quickly do, you, do they pop up to the top? Okay, we're, we know we want to be the top of the mind awareness. We know we work hard through those search engines to get to the top. And so where are they? Or maybe where are they physically located? What's the atmosphere, again, of both their website, social media pages, or their actual brick and mortar store. How are they priced? You know, pricing isn't always meaning to be the lowest is the best, but we're looking at value. So how does what they offer compare their pricing with the rest of the market? And how do they advertise? Okay, what are they doing to advertise their product or service? So jot those few things down, um, score them five being the highest and one to be the lowest. Obviously, those that ends up with, end up with the highest scores mean that is your largest competition. And so then we're going to take those largest competitors, and it may be all four that you want to do, that you have done this analysis on, and we're going to put them into, whoops, excuse me, we're going to put them into the SWOT analysis. And it looks like that one didn't copy for me. But basically what we're gonna do there is again, list their strengths, their weaknesses, their opportunities, and their threats. So their strengths, okay, mean it's your threat. So it's threatening you by them taking or gaining those clients that you want. 
And what we want to do is eliminate or mitigate those threats. We're gonna look at their weaknesses and we're gonna turn those into the O of the SWAT, which means opportunities, right? So their weakness obviously becomes an opportunity for you to get the clients that they're missing. So your strengths are the threats and we need to know how to mitigate those against our competition their weaknesses, or your opportunities. So SWOT, if you haven't heard that term before, okay? So that basically brings us up to date and starting on session two today. So if you recall last week, I went about 15 minutes over until someone pointed out to me that I was running over. And as I said, I apologize, but for some reason I had 90 minutes in my head. Uh, so we would have been right on. But we're going to move on today, and I am aware of the time frame. We are now down to about 43 minutes. So now we need to plan to start a business, okay? So what we have, have covered so far is basically the background. So we're learning about what it takes to be in business and how do we know if, if this is something that we want to pursue. Now we're going to talk about the planning. And remember I said that businesses who plan are what? Surely somebody remembers that. They are 30% more successful, okay? So that's why we're going to talk about how we can plan and be best planned. I shared with you the business plan template and uh, hopefully you got a chance to look at that and start and again, implement the sections that we discussed last week. Because as we move through this, you can see we're covering a lot of material in a short time, which is why we're sharing the recording and the handouts with you. So you can go back and easily reference this as you're writing your business plan. But by following the suggested implementation from week to week, you will then complete your written plan business plan at the end of the six weeks. So the role of planning starts at step number one the planning process. We decide that we're going to make a plan. And step number two, we take action. In step number three, we get results. In step number four, we measure and record those results. Let me give you an example. We actually do this every day and we do it probably subconsciously. So, we get up every day and we say, okay, I'm going to have my coffee. I'm going to eat my breakfast, take my shower, get dressed, and I'm going to be out the door to go to work at eight o'clock in the morning. So that's what we've done. We've now planned that that's what we need to do. And so in step two, we do that. We get up, we have our coffee, we eat our breakfast, we get dressed, we get out the door. All of a sudden we arrive at work 10 minutes late. And so our plan did not work because we were not at work on time. So we've seen the results in step three. And number four, we have to measure and record our results. And so we say, oh my goodness, what happened that I didn't get to work on time? Well, perhaps our car wouldn't start or there was snow on the ground, or maybe we ran into a train. Hopefully we didn't run into it, but hopefully it held us up on our way to work. So we compare our actual versus our planned results and we explain the difference. So that difference is my car wouldn't start or I needed to stop for gas or I needed to stop for that train. So we integrate the changes. So the next day when we plan our day, we might say, I need to get up 15 minutes earlier or I need to take a different route to work because I can't wait on that train whatever it might be, but we make a change so that then when we take our action, get our results, we do arrive to work on time. Again, that's very simplistic, but that's all we're actually doing as we do our written business plan. And there are some very important planning terms to help you in that process. The first one is the mission statement. And a mission statement is actually the organization's purpose or reason for being. It should describe the major areas of interest, the scope of the actions, the basic market it intends to satisfy, 
and its primary values. You may have heard this, uh, heard the phrase, an elevator speech. And we use this in a lot of different ways and even um, some of our, our personal training and personal development. And, and quite frankly, it's, it's very similar to that. But the elevator statement means if you get on the elevator on the first floor and you're going to the fourth floor and someone says, what is it that you do? You basically have the amount of time from the first floor to the third floor to explain to that person what it is you do. And so by having your mission statement, you can very clearly state that to whoever it, whoever it is you want to express that to in a very short period of time. So a mission statement should be very direct. It should be very um, ex explanatory and it should be very succinct, okay? So I suggest that you Google some mission statements from places that you know. Uh, larger organizations generally will have them posted on their websites. And I suggest that you look at those and, and see what you think about their particular mission statements. Does it do what the mission statement is set out to do? And that is overall um, state the organization's purpose or reason for being. And then our goals that we set are broad statements of organizational achievements or accomplishments. They further define the mission statement. And so maybe it, it is, um, and I'm going to oversimplify this for an example. Maybe it is we want to make the best pizza in the Lima region. Well, our goals then are how are we going to know that, what are we going to do to know that we are making the best pizza in the Lima region? Strategies are long-term plans or approaches that you take for accomplishing your goals. So you might say, we're gonna start with all fresh ingredients in our pizza sauce, or we're gonna make our crust from scratch. It's not going to be a frozen variety, okay? Those are strategies to um, make those goals, reach those goals uh, that will fulfill your mission statement. So here we're starting at the bottom, okay? Uh, we're starting at the top down, and then each one of them we're going to explain in more detail. And then the objectives are actually measurable steps that help you achieve that strategy, okay? So if we're going to make our pizza sauce from scratch, on Monday of every week, we're going to need 10 pounds of tomatoes delivered, okay? And then by Wednesday, we um, have to have those tomatoes smashed and dashed so that we can add the ingredients and have fresh sauce to go on Thursday when our previous week's supply has run out. Again, very simplified. But while we're going through this process, um, the goal should, should be very, very specific. And I'm going to skip a couple here and then we'll jump back to this. While we're talking about this, I want to get to the mission statement. Okay, so characteristics of a good mission statement are, it reflects the core purpose and the direction of the company. It embodies basic values of both the owners and employees. And remember the business plan is going to help the owners and employees get the same values, okay? It's going to help them all go in the same direction as we discussed. It is short and focused, 25 words or less, okay? And that's imperative. They can get very wordy. You're never going to remember even uh, the gist of it, even what you're trying to say if it's beyond that, all right? It's not over elaborate, um, elaborate and, and full of words that don't mean Main any sense, the platitudes. It stresses the uniqueness of the company. So in 25 words or less, what I suggest you do is start with a blank piece of paper and draft your mission statement. It's not going to start with 25 words, okay? It's very likely to be much more lengthy than that. 
But once you've got what you feel your mission statement should be, you can go back and start cutting out some words that are generally repetitive or that may not be specific. Okay, they may be platitudes. And so eventually you'll come up with a mission statement that is 25 words or less. Anybody have a question on that? Continue. Okay. So then based on that mission statement, as I said, we're then going to, to set some goals. And so what are some characteristics of good goals? Well, first, goals should be phrased in terms of outcomes rather than actions. Okay, so let's, um, let's say that we want to um, sell the most pizzas in the Lima area. Okay, sell the most pizzas, what's that mean? We have no idea what our competition sells. So maybe we say, we want to sell 100 pizzas a week, okay? So that is an outcome rather than an action. And they should be measurable. In the sentence I just used, in the example I just used, there's clearly a measurable in there. And what was that? 100, 100 pizzas. They should be challenging yet realistic. So is it realistic to sell 100 pizzas in a week? That depends on how many hours you're open. Again, those, those wonderful things. Um, who's your competition? What are you going to do to differentiate yourself? Okay, so 100 pizzas a week might be challenging, but it's achievable. And our goals should be in three categories. They should be easy, medium and hard. We do that for our own satisfaction, okay? If we have nothing but hard goals and we are never reaching those goals, maybe we've set them a little too high, it is nothing but a negative. It is nothing but depressing to us and to our employees. Rather, we want to start and set some easy goals so that we can celebrate achieving those and then work to reach our medium and our hard goals. And oftentimes you can do all three of these at the same time. In fact, I highly suggest that you have easy, medium and hard goals that you're working on constantly. But we wanna have some easy ones that, so that we can build self-confidence in ourselves and say, hey, my plan worked, I can do that. And we can celebrate because we've reached these goals. And then we could go on and the medium ones become easy ones for us and the hard ones become medium. And, and certainly then as we reflect back on what our goals were, we're finding that we are reaching them. And they should be communicated again. If everyone working with you or for you does not understand the goals they are expected to meet, you cannot be disappointed if they are not met. We can't obtain a goal unless we know what that goal is. And so they have to be communicated. And one of the best ways to communicate them is through a written business plan, which is what you are going to accomplish. They need to be smart. And this is very important. If you can remember smart goals, they, it will make your job a lot easier in setting those goals. So they need to be specific, exact, particular, and detailed. The first goal I threw out there arbitrarily was very specific, was it not? It said 100 pizzas in one week. So we've also covered measurable, so that's quantifiable and considerable. It's acceptable. If we reach that, it's very satisfactory and pleasing. Sci it's realistic, it's sensible, true, lifelike, credible. Yes, we can attain that. And it's timely, suitable, opportune, and sensible because I said one week, okay? So is it smart, specific, measurable, acceptable, realistic, and timely? When you set a goal, 
Think about that. Does it meet the SMART test? And if it meets the SMART test, then you're able to obtain it. So what I again suggest you do is this exercise. So look at your year one to three goals. And I would do year one, year two, and year three on three separate pieces of paper. And so for year one, I want to set three hard goals. What do you consider a real challenge? Challenge yourself. What are three hard goals to reach? Then let's look at three medium goals. Again, we're talking within the first year and then three easy goals. So if you're a startup business, you may want to look at it in terms of quarters. So in the first quarter, as we're starting up, let's look at our easy goals. And then in, in months four through six, let's try to reach our medium goals. And now that we've got some uh, experience under our belt, we're starting to you know, build our clientele. Now let's focus on reaching our hard goals. And every time that you reach and then do the same thing for year two and year three, okay? And every time that you reach one of those goals is a reason for celebration. And then those goals should be replaced. You should constantly be working on a manageable nine goals or thereabouts, okay? That's not a magic number, but that's, again, it's a realistic number to, to work on and to reach. So now that we've set our goals, take goal one from year one and list that on this paper. And then you say, what strategy am I gonna use to reach that goal? In other words, what is my plan to get there? It could be in, in terms of marketing, it might be um, in sales. It, there's lots of things that you could assigned to that goal to help you reach it. And you'll do the same thing with goal two and goal three. And again, you'll look at year one and do your strategies, year two and do your strategies, and year three and do your strategies. And then we're going to look at the objectives. And so how am I going to make that happen? So let's say that in order to sell those 100 pizzas per week, my strategy is to blow up Facebook. And how are you going to do that? Well, we need to look at that objective. What is that going to be? Maybe it is five posts um, in, the, in the first day that we open in our grand opening. Okay. Um, that would be an objective to reach that strategy which is going to then reach our goal. So hopefully you understand that concept there. It, it, sometimes they seem repetitive, but they really are very different. And again, remember that they have to be timely and realistic, okay? All right, now we're gonna go back and we're gonna talk about some different ways that you might Start your business, okay? So, a lot of clients these days are starting their business as a part-time business. It makes sense as you're building a business because remember that we may not, in a startup business, realize any paycheck or any profit from our business for upwards of of 18 months to two years is not unusual. And again, depending on what type of business you're in, what your, your startup costs were, it could even be longer than that. And so many people are not able to go without an income while they're starting their business. So they'll use a startup as a part-time business to begin with. So what are the benefits of a part-time business? Job security, safety net in the event of downsizing, right? So let's say your full-time job um, got cut to, you know, part-time. Um, you now have another part-time income to rely on. 
income patching, extra cash for family sufficiency. Maybe there's a particular goal that you and your family have in mind. Maybe it's just an overall increase in your income and it's your current levels of full-time employment and that is not attainable. So they want to start up another side business so that they can bring in more income. Feasibility testing, it's a trial run for a full-time business. Well, I'm gonna start this online and I'm gonna see how it's accepted or I'm going to start it with working um, trade shows and I'm gonna see how that is accepted. And if I'm doing well there, then my goal is to turn it into a full-time business that can be self-sustainable. Personal satisfaction, quality of life issues, that improves. Obviously, uh, income has a lot to do with that, but also challenging yourself, challenging that entrepreneur spirit inside of you can do a lot for personal satisfaction and improve your quality of life. But the challenges are oftentimes your work or education conflicts. So we, while we just looked at the upside to working an additional job, it could also be a conflict because perhaps your work schedule isn't flexible enough for you to uh, run your business at the time that you feel you need to be tending to it. There may be other family commitments, time constraints, credibility issues, Okay, and financial concerns. I'll address credibility issues for a moment in saying that if you were going to get a loan um, to start your business up and you know you tell the banker, yeah, it's going to be a part-time business. So I'm just going to kind of get started in it. You know, they, it, It's a little more different, difficult to convince them that you're 100% in, if you will. Okay, um, But that doesn't mean that it's impossible. And again, oftentimes, if you're starting a part-time, the, the, the startup costs are so much lower that you may not even need uh, any outside sources of funding. So there are many advantages to kind of getting your toe in the water, if you will, and seeing. It's also a good test run. Is this something that I want to pursue before you've committed lots and lots of money, time, and energy into it? Home-based businesses, many part-time businesses become home-based businesses. There are great advantages. For example, the flexibility in scheduling gives you independence as you're working from your home. Lower startup co costs, obviously, and less overhead. You have more time to spend with your family because you are in the same location with them. It's increased job satisfaction. There are tax advantages because typically, um, depending on how you organize your business, you're only taxed once, and that's on the income that you make from the business. The business itself doesn't pay taxes because it was profitable. It has a positive effect on the community, but there are disadvantages like you're isolated. Again, you're working from home. Some of us have experienced that through this pandemic. There are pros and cons definitely from working at home, which I liken to run in a home-based business. You lose your privacy, especially if you have people, clients, customers coming in and out of your home. Um, there is a sense of loss of privacy. And again, credibility issues. Are you really dedicated to that? Because after all, it's a home-based business. There might be problems with zoning and I, I strongly urge you to check this before making a decision if you um, are thinking about a home-based business. Communities, um, have zoning so that it protects the integrity of a residential area. Primarily, they are concerned when we're talking about increased traffic to a neighborhood. So if you're running an internet business out of your home, it's not likely that there's going to be an issue with zoning. However, if you have customers coming to your place, to your home, and creating additional traffic in your neighborhood, there is going to be a concern. So certainly I encourage you, um, if you're gonna run a home-based business, to check with your local government authority and see, A, what is it zoned? Can you actually run a home-based business from there? And so Kathy, yes. I have a question. When you talk about your local government authority, do they start like with their city? 
village or do they just go straight to the township? And how does that work if, like for instance, I'm in, I'm in Elida. So I would most likely go to the village of Elida and then do I need to check with American Township as well at the same time? It's whoever has the authority. So whoever set up the zoning for your particular neighborhood. Okay. So that could be American Township or it could be the village of Elida. There are where, some overlaps in there, right? Where yeah. would I find that information out? That's a very good question. Um, again, I would make a call um, or go on their website, okay? And almost every uh, jurisdiction now has a zoning map. Actually, I will give you a one-stop shop and you can figure that out easier. The Lima Allen County Regional Planning Commission, mm -hmm. go to their website and every um, jurisdiction within the within the, the county is listed there and they have a zoning map for everyone uploaded to their website so it works out great awesome i will get that link and put it in the chat box for everybody Thanks, thank Stephanie. you kathy okay so when thinking about a home-based business there are some decisions that you need to make about setting up a functional office um, while you're still projecting a professional business image. Again, know the laws and regulations. And if, if you're going to work with someone, are they an employee versus an independent contractor? And I can tell you that, of course, most of us want to have independent contractors working with us because it's generally less costly. However, I can also tell you that the Internal Revenue Service is really taking a close look at those independent contractors or people that you 1099 within your business. And I can go into further detail about that um, if anyone has further questions, but it's a very clear black and white rule. There is no gray area and the IRS will not tolerate um, anyone who does not abide by that. So it has become very popular to just 1099 everybody and they are really starting to audit and crack down on that. So I encourage you to be very, very careful as you take those, um, those steps in making that determination. And again, they, the IRS has a publication that clearly states the differences and how they should be handled. And I can also assist you with that if you have any questions. And then the tax implications. What is that going to, to change on your taxes? Um, I mentioned employees versus independent contractors. Generally, if you have someone as an employee, it's going to cost approximately 25% more than just their wage. So to put it that in perspective, um, let's say you're paying your employee $10 an hour, we would need to add $2.50 to their hourly wage, wage to cover those tax issues. And those tax issues are um, Medicare, the employee's share of Medicare, Social Security, workers' compensation, which is required for anyone who has employees, and uh, your unemployment insurance, which is also required for anyone who has employees. So there are certain things that we cannot avoid. And again, typically it's about 25% additional cost to the business. And then what are your insurance needs? So I, I covered workers' compensation. Obviously, your liability insurance will look different if you have employees. And uh, are you home-based business? What does that do to your homeowner's insurance if you have people coming in and out? Now, clearly, if you're sitting at home behind your desk doing an internet business, that's not going to change your liability. But if you've got stock sitting in your basement, it's going to imp uh, increase your, your coverage needed for contents. And so we have to take all those things into consideration. Okay. So the types of home businesses that are currently being operated, 53.8 of them are in the construction, healthcare, real estate, wholesaling, legal service, or education um, business sector, while 30% are in computer services and consulting. Just 11.8% are in retail sales, but I would venture to say that we have seen that grow over the last year and 4.4 in crafts or manufacturing. So 
those who go out and like I said, do trade shows, craft shows, whatever, um, manufacture it in their home and then take it elsewhere to, to sell. And in the retail sales, most of those again are kind of a drop ship thing. Um, not so much where their home is actually open for people to come in and browse and, and look at their goods, if you will. Here's a partial listing of some home originated companies. You're going to see some big names on there, some big hitters. And this is just in here for kind, kind of fun. So, you know, as you're thinking about starting your business and considering if it could be home based, take a look at the success of some of these people who had a vision very similar to yours at one point in time. And they have built it to the multi-million dollar companies that they are. So let's evaluate that business idea. Can this idea be turned into a business? Or is this maybe something that is just a hobby? Or is it a hobby that has now grown that it can become a business? Is there a real need for the product or service? Or is it just our perception that it's needed? And we talked about surveying, I believe, and, and surveying is one way to find out. And you'll find out who will buy it and how many will they buy? Is there competition in this field and how much competition is there? How much growth potential exists? In other words, what market share is left? And what product or service lines could we expand upon that our competition isn't doing? that would make it a real need. One of the ways to find out what the market share is, again, is about that hard data, the demographic information that we spoke about earlier. Um, there are reports, and again, through um, our office, we're able to get, basically, people have ex an, a, an X amount of expendable income, and they have enough data research to show that of the total expendable income in an area, X amount of it is, is spent on multiple different things, okay? And it might be um, dining out, it might be carry out foods, it might be sports and leisure. It, 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 you know, again, the things that we looked at, it might be um, exercise clothing, it might be memberships to the gyms. And so if we see that the total expendable income in that particular area is let's say $100,000. And in our area, 150,000 is already being expended. That would be a red flag and an indicator to me that there probably isn't any more room in the market for another type of business in the, to open in that line. So those are some of the things that we need to look at as well as can I afford to do this business? now or can i ever afford to do it maybe it's just not realistic okay and and how do you determine that again what is what kind of cat cash do you have to uh, to um inject into this business and is that all of your savings is that really what you want to do put all of your eggs in one basket okay maybe that isn't the time so we we aren't able to get a, a loan to help start our business for whatever reason, because that isn't easy to do today either. And so maybe we just can't afford to do it right now. So maybe we take a step back and we look at some ways that we can, again, get our foot in the water and yet um, grow it to where it will reach our expectations. And what's at risk? The money, our job requirements? Are we going to be taking too much time away from our other job? In building this, that it puts our other job at risk that we really can't afford to lose. And if I decide not to do the deal, have I failed? And I will say to you, absolutely not. It might be the best decision you have ever made in doing all of this prep work and evaluating your business idea and you decide not to do it. It could save you lots and lots of money it could save your marriage, your family, your friendships with many people, okay? There's lots of things that you need to consider. And so if you decide to do it, you have not failed. As a matter of fact, oftentimes many business people have decided not to do the deal or have even started and changed their path multiple times. It is not unusual. It's just like when we talk about when you 
set out on your path to college, right? Everybody has a degree focus in mind. How many times do we change that before we get through college? Three to four, right? So the same thing with your business idea. And as you're starting to do your research and learn more and more about it, you can certainly tweak it. And then maybe it's going to come up to the real business that you had in mind, the real thing that's right for you and it's right for the market. It's right for the time when you're ready to do it. <clears throat> so if you had a perfect business, if you could design the perfect business in an ideal business world, what characteristics would it have? Okay, so now we're kind of going to be the dreamer. We're going to kind of use that right brain that entrepreneurs are so famous for using. And I want you to write down 10 things. And then I want you to rate them over to the right on those short lines. And prioritize them from one to 10. Okay. So a perfect business in an ideal business world with no outside factors, what characteristics would it have? That includes looking at trends, downsizing businesses, aging population. It's an information age, as we discussed many times already. Global interdependence. Indeed, look what happened in the Suez Canal this week. Isn't that amazing, the impact that that had? Fitness and health is on the top of everyone's mind. Career flexibility. Ethical concerns, environmental concerns are all very popular and home-based business startups are rising rapidly. Time savers for working families. You might be familiar with them um, and they're called lots of different things and, and I am certainly not promoting any of them. And if I happen to use a name that you recognize, it's not intentional, but I'm gonna say Crock-Pot Tuesdays. So there are people that you can drop your, drop your Crock-Pot off on Monday night or Tuesday morning Pick that crock pot meal up, prepared, ready to take home and serve your family on Tuesday evening. Uh, those types of things have, have really been um, time savers for working families and have become very popular. Corporate outsourcing. Maybe we don't have the facilities to um, paint or powder coat that trailer hitch that we wanna sell. So let's look at who we might partner with that could do that for us. Return to nostalgia. It's that warm, fuzzy feeling. How many times have you gone in somewhere and said, wow, that's like back in the 70s or that's like in the 80s. That's becoming more and more popular in terms of colors, in terms of styles, in terms of everything. And so what's that warm, fuzzy for, again, that age demographic that you are targeting? Some key elements to retail are your customers, your products, suppliers, working long hours, dealing with landlords, employees, which are difficult in today's world. Record keeping can be tedious. You have lots of small items that are hopefully moving rapidly and security. And in service businesses, we need to consider what segment is our customer? Provide reliable and consistent service or they're not gonna remain your customer. Pride their services at compatible yet profitable levels. Like I said, doesn't mean you have to be the least expensive, but you need to offer a good value. People will pay more if they feel that it's a good value and they're getting treated differently than your competition treats them. Provide innovative services. Deliver the service you say you will and meet deadlines. Focus all resources to meet your customer's needs because your customer is the only essential ingredient needed in a successful business, as you'll recall from last week. And so that brings us right on time and right back to the implementation section for this week. So now that we've learned about our mission, goals, and strategies, we can begin to look at section four of our written business plan template. So last week, we implemented sections two and three. And if you haven't done so, I encourage you to get those tidied up so that you can start on section four and stay on track. 
So with that, I am going to come back on video and see if anyone has any questions that I can answer for you. Thank you, Kathy. I really appreciate all of your work today and wanted just to put a reminder out to everybody that you could unmute and ask any questions that you may have in regards to section two and three that was uh, to be implemented uh, last week. And just a reminder that when you are working on this, you have Kathy's contact information and you can email her uh, questions, give her a call and she will get in touch with you um, to help you. Thank you, Tara, appreciate it. Um, and, you know, wonderful amounts of information. Funny that you brought up the zoning. Um, I was just in a meeting this morning where we had talked about that, how different areas have different zoning regulations. And somebody asked where we're supposed to start with that. And no one had any idea. <laughs> so thank you for that information. Um, I figured I would, me personally, would contact the village and go from there just because that's where I pay my water bill and seem to have to get permits and stuff from them. So, um, that would be correct. That's probably who has that jurisdiction. Yep. Great. Yeah, just out of curiosity. Um, but of course, you know, everybody's different. So, um, I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday weekend this weekend. Stay safe and enjoy your families. And we will see you back here next Tuesday. This is a reoccurring link. Uh, you can use it every week and of course it is recorded and um, you will receive a copy of the recording within 48 hours thank you thanks have a, wonderful week. Have a great week enjoy the sunshine bye-bye bye-bye